My name is Chris Grillis. I uh, help with the community groups here at Bright. And it's my first time speaking an English service, so I hope that um, you see that I'm a Greek kid, um, not a Russian kid, and I hope this sermon is just not all Greek to you. Um, so what I want to do is something different uh, before starting. I want us to all, for the next few minutes, just think of a story in your life that you'll never forget. A story that happened, it's so clear to you that you'll never forget it, and I want you to turn to your neighbor and share that story. So let's spend the next couple minutes doing that. So later on today, I'm going to share a, a few stories about my life that I'm never going to forget. Uh, but for right now, I just want you to all think about that story that you just shared, and what if it's so important to you that someone else shared it, but they shared it in a different way that was not true. They left out a fact. They left out the most important event of your story. How painful would that be if it's just a, just a cherished memory of yours? And that's what's going on today. That's what we're going to be talking about in this sermon, is this, uh, this term that's going around. It's called fake news, but let's call it sensational news, because it's always been around. It's an iteration that's uh, coming back. And here's some examples that we see right now. And I'm not taking a political stance, so don't, um, don't see it this way. Um, but Politico reported that a company overseen by Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin had foreclosed on a 90-year-old woman due to a 27-cent error. 27 cents. The Competitive Enterprise Institute determined that there was no foreclosure and a different company was involved. Here's another one. CNN reporter uh, reported that Nancy Sinatra, the daughter of Frank Sinatra, was not happy with President Trump's inaugural dance to her father's song, My Way. She reacted, why do you lie, CNN? A Time reporter tweeted that Trump removed the Martin Luther King Jr. bust, which is a head statue, from the Oval Office. And then later on, the reporter quickly corrected his tweet. And the Associated Press reported that Donald Trump's voter fraud expert was registered to vote in three states. However, they found out he was only registered to vote in one. Now, these stories may not mean much to you at all, but regardless of your political stance, regardless, if a lie is told, it can distort reality, it can distort the truth, and it gets people to think differently than how reality actually is. There's something that happened on air earlier this year in February by an MSNBC anchor, Mika Brzezinski, talking about President Trump. She said, well, I think that the dangerous, you know, edges here are that he is trying to undermine the media and trying to make up his own facts. And it could be that while unemployment and the economy worsens, he could have undermined the messaging so much that he can actually control exactly what people think. And that, that is our job. Adolf Hitler even said, if you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. There's a man named Leo Frank back in 1917. He was a Jewish American uh, factory superintendent. He was an educated man from the north, went down south, to work in the, this factory. On the South economy was almost always an agricultural economy, and the South was having high tensions with the North because their whole economy was changing. So they didn't like Leo Frank coming down. Well, he was convicted of rape and murder of a 13-year-old girl whose body was found in the basement of their factory. News circulation spread, a Southern newspaper the Atlantic spread, causing public arousal. Everybody wanted Leo Frank dead. They were chanting, hang the Jew, hang the Jew, hang the Jew, during his court case, which came to an almost immediate conviction. He was sentenced to death. But then some new testimony came up, and the judge suggested that he should change his sentence to life. So the governor tried to protect him, 
by putting him in high security prison. And a well-known journalist in the North started looking into the media of the South. They looked into the newspaper and they found no less than six stories of sensational news, news that was fabricated to cause public arousal about Leo Frank. Well, they, this reporter tried to get that Southern newspaper to change the public opinion, to retract their statements so that Leo Frank could have a fair trial, but they refused. They refused. And about a month later, 25 men stormed to that prison, captured Leo Frank, and hung him at a crossroads. Nineteen eighty two comes around many years later. A man, eighty three years old, gave sworn testimony, passing a lie detector test and a psychological stress test. He provided his eyewitness account that the factory janitor, Jim Conley, had raped and murdered that thirteen year old girl. See, that's what happens when sensational news circulates. Lies are detrimental. And today's passage is a battle of truth and sensational news. We can see it being dangerous. It can amass followers that creates permanent damage. And without proper testimony, the truth can be lost. So if we can go to the next slide, Do we have a clicker or? Um, well, in order to get there, guys, um, we have to understand what truth is. I'm going to give you an overview of truth. And what we're going to do is go to the next slide as well. And we're going to go over the definition of objective truth. An objective truth states that the state or quality of being true, even outside of the subject's individual biases, Interpretations, feelings, and imaginings it's from Wikipedia. And Ravi Zacharias says, he's a famous apologist, says, truth is that which affirms propositionally the nature of reality as it is. And then R.C. Sproul says, truth is defined as which corresponds to reality as perceived by God because God's perception of reality is never distorted. And then the next slide is that there might be some popular responses to this. That may be truth for you, but not truth for me. Your truth is not my truth. So on the next slide, we see what is relativism. It's knowledge, truth, and morality exists in relation to culture, society, or historical context, and are not absolute. Or relativism is a philosophical position that all points of view are equally valid and that truth is relative to the individual. On the next slide, we can see that objective standard of relativism is not noble. It's, universal, it's not universally applicable to all people, and it's entirely useless. So truth and relativism are not a match for each other. absolute truth and values. So here we have this war. We have this war of absolute truth that's starting to get intermixed. Absolute truth exists throughout all cultures no matter what. It's like math. One plus one equals two in all cultures. However, values are things that are different. That makes us unique as different cultures. Different cultures speak different languages. They value English here in America. They value Russian and Russia and other surrounding countries. It exists in culture. The danger, on the next slide, is if they're interchangeable. It's this interchangeableness of the values with truth was popularized by this German philosopher named Friedrich Nietzsche in the 19th century, 1800s. He said, you have your way, I have my way. As for the right way, the correct way, and the only way, it does not exist. This quote will echo throughout time, to one of the most atrocious defenses in history. So let's fast forward to a world devastated by war, genocide, starvation. 
A people group that was persecuted so severely it's not forgotten to this very day. It was a world uh, plagued by a man who said, if you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. Next slide. You can see the aftermath. It's 1945. The war is over. Germany has surrendered. And now justice is being ready to be carried out for those who are responsible for World War II and that genocide that happened. We're in a courtroom. The crowd is angry. The people want justice against the Nazis for their war crimes against humanity. Next slide. It's called the Nuremberg Trials. It happened at the end of World War II. And the Nazi offense was this. Just, I'm just following the law of the land. Jews had no value in Germany. That's what the law was. Jews were not considered a people under the law. Therefore, taking of a Jewish life was not a crime. But then the prosecution appealed to the natural law. They can appealed to the moral law saying that all people have the right to life. It doesn't matter what culture you're in. It doesn't matter what your law says. It's a law that's objective and true across all people. It's written on our hearts. It's God-given. The verdict, the Nazis were convicted under the natural law. A truth that applies to everyone. It doesn't matter if you believe it to not be your reality. Not just because you don't believe it to be true. See, what we learn from this is that truth, across, truth exists across all people, all culture groups. It's essential to maintain. If we don't maintain the truth, then lies will devastate mankind. They will devastate our culture. So ultimately, we need the truth. And that leads us to our passage. Peter here is, is trying to maintain the truth amongst believers because there's false teachers, false prophets coming in, trying to bring this sensational news, this different news that's not true. And Peter is reinforcing that, look, I'm an eyewitness of the truth. So let's read our passage. It's on 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. In the next slide, we're going to cover the necessity of knowledge. We're going to cover the validity of an eyewitness. And lastly, we'll cover the reality of of Jesus. I want us to end up seeing the truth of who Jesus is so we can be prepared for him at any moment. So necessity of knowledge. Well, let's back up to the beginning of this chapter. We can see Peter stresses knowledge so much. And I know that love is more important than knowledge. But Peter stresses knowledge so many times Verse 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, our, of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, through the knowledge of him. Verse 5, and virtue with knowledge. Verse 8, the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. The question then becomes, is the Bible reliable? Can the Bible be trusted is it just truth that I'm is it truth that I'm learning or is it just pretend facts and I'm just gaining a bunch of knowledge about pretend facts that don't matter? I'm going to read to you a very interesting article that focused on the family posted. They're a global Christian ministry that's dedicated to helping families thrive. I wanted to break this down in summary for you, but it's just so well written that I had to share. The New Testament 
contains 27 books. Although some are not books per se, but letters. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are key in establishing what we know about Jesus, including his birth, ministry, teachings, death, resurrection, and more. There are several lines of reasoning we can take in demonstrating the reliability of the New, Testaments, the New Testament and specifically the four Gospels. First, we can look at the number of manuscripts or fragments available. Second, we can compare existing manuscripts and fragments to see if they are reliable when it comes to what they report. Here, we would look for serious contradictions, omissions, additions, errors, etc., Third, we can compare manuscript copies and fragments with copies we have today and find out if there have been significant changes or if the New Testament we have today is reliable. The approach outlined in these three points highlights some aspects of what takes place in the discipline known as textual criticism. In the case of the New Testament, we have thousands of complete manuscripts. So thousands of complete New Testaments, right? and multiple thousands of more fragments available. There's more than 5,000 complete copies, or almost complete copies, of the New Testament. In addition, we have several thousand more fragments, or smaller portions, of the New Testament. If these don't seem like a lot, compared to other works of ancient history, the manuscript evidence and copies for the New Testament far outweigh manuscript evidence for other works. For instance, there are less than 700 copies of Homer's The Iliad and only a handful of copies of any one work of Aristotle. So when it comes to manuscript evidence, the New Testament definitely has numbers on its side. And they continue, it is also interesting that within the early centuries of the Christian church, a number of scholars quoted the New Testament. Amazingly, they quoted the New Testament so much that every single verse of all 27 books of the New Testament is quoted by these scholars with the exception of only 11 verses, all within a few hundred years of the beginning of the church. We can also add the fact that much of the New Testament was written within just a few decades of the death and resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians, for instance, dates from the 50s. Only 20 years or so, the 50s, 80, not 1950s. Uh, Only 20 years or so after the death and resurrection of Christ. There, this is important because 1 Corinthians 15 contains key elements of the gospel message emphasizing the importance of Christ's resurrection and claiming that more than 500 people had seen the risen Christ. People who would still have been alive at the time of writing 1 Corinthians would have been around to corroborate or criticize the claims of the, in the letter. And there's so much more that they write that could be argued to support the reliability of the New Testament. So some points, which is the next slide. It's 99.5, one more, there we go. 99.5% textually pure, over 5,000 complete or almost complete New Testament copies. It's more accurate than any other document in history, and it matches up perfectly with history. So for time's sake, if you want to go uh, research more about is the Bible reliable, is it trustworthy, please uh, take that time on your own to do so. So on the next slide, we can see there's two points we need to cover in knowledge. We need to cover Peter's last will for us. It's going to be from verse 15. And the vulnerability to false teachers and prophets that we face. How do we prepare against false prophets and teachers? So next slide, verse 15 And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able to, at any time, recall these things. Simply put, Peter is writing his knowledge to us. He's writing his last will. If you have a will, you're wanting to designate your items to your heirs so that when you die, this is you speaking to your heirs of what assets go to which person. Peter is saying, I want you every person here and every person in the future church to be equipped so we don't lose sight of the truth. Next slide. Next point is vulnerability to false teachers and prophets. He's likely being accused, Peter, of of not sharing the truth. These false teachers, these sweet talkers or um, Jews of the time are coming in and preaching that 
Christ isn't coming again. Are you kidding? Where is your Christ? Where is your risen Christ? He's not coming. You said He's coming. And we know that Peter's talking about the second coming in this um, chapter, in this verse, because he uses the word parousia, which basically means the, um, the second coming. It means coming, but it really refers to the second coming, because that's how that Greek word is used um, throughout the, old, the New Testament. So these false teachers can come in many forms, and in chapter 2 of 2 Peter is going to cover that. So what we're going to do is cover three areas, salvation, sanctification, and know the scriptures, the sure word, for us to be able to protect ourselves from false teachers. So salvation. What is salvation? Anyone know what salvation is? You can raise your hands if you know. If you don't know, then salvation is deliverance from danger or suffering. Okay, great term. But what am I in danger of? What is mankind in danger of? Is it physical persecution? Is it ISIS? Is it depression? Is it uh, gender issues? Is it rights being taken away? Guns being taken away? Being taxed? Being in poverty? No. It's, it's not any of those. It's we're in danger because of our sin towards God. We're in danger when we die that because we disobey God, we must pay the wage of death. That means death, separation from God forever. It's eternal suffering, or in other words, it's hell. That's what mankind is in danger of. And that's what we need salvation from. So what's the gospel? Gospel is good news, of course. It's good news of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. Why is it good? It's because Jesus allows us to be able to reconnect with God so that we will not perish. We'll be saved. So every Christian here, every Christian, everyone who's a Christian here, I think, really needs to know the gospel. Needs to know the gospel inside and out in long and full detail, every aspect of it, but also in short too. So at any moment you could share the gospel and, and keep yourself away from somebody teaching you something that's false. In short, it's because we sin. We're, we're going to die. We're going to face God. We're going to be judged. Without Christ, we will be separated from God forever. But God, Christ incarnate, Jesus God incarnate came to the earth to live a perfect life. He came to die in our place and to be raised from the dead so that we could be restored with God for those who believe in him. And he's coming again. But this time he's coming to bring the sword to those who don't believe. So it's essential. It's essential to Christian life that we know the gospel because false teachers can come in and say, look, you need works. You need to have works to be able to earn salvation. You have to do something. You have to go help the poor. You have to come to my church. You have to give money to my church to be able to go to heaven. And if we're not careful, they can use smooth talking. They can twist what the gospel is and then add something which is detrimental and dangerous. Because the gospel is grace alone. The gospel is is." Christ did it all for us. And for the skeptics sitting here, they're like, you know, don't really believe. Well, I just encourage you this. I encourage you to go to the jugular. Go to the jugular of Christianity and attack the resurrection of Christ. Disprove it. Because Christianity relies on the resurrection. If, if the resurrection didn't happen, me being up here is pointless. Us being in this church is pointless. Might as well go back being Jews. That's what Paul writes about in the New Testament. But with the resurrection being true, you're in grave danger if you don't believe. Then there's sanctification. Sanctification as Christians is a little different than salvation. And what it is, it's we're, we believe in Jesus 
we're saved, but then it's from now till the rest of our lives just being made holy. It's us being more and more like God. It's what God, it's what God does in our lives. It's not what we do. And we're called, we're called to grow in Christ. And for myself, I want to share a personal story. I told you I'd share you a few. Almost four years ago, I became a believer. And I was a, really a baby believer. I wasn't um, somebody who had all this knowledge and then became a believer. I, I knew next to nothing. Let's, uh, let's be really honest, I knew almost nothing. But for a full year, I was growing. And I was being taught and fed. And I was walking with God out of love. He was sanctifying me. He was changing me. But then after about a year, God started to show me that the people around me were beginning to teach me false ways to walk with God. God revealed their hearts to me. And God revealed that their hearts were legalistic, which is they're trying to earn favor with God by doing something rather than relying on his grace. And it was hard for me to really see that because I was so new. And I was, but I was the witness of this. They tried to plant false guilt into me. They tried to say that you have this sin in your life when I didn't. I was walking with God. I was being sanctified. And God was changing me. And I had nothing to do with that anymore. But yet they kept accusing me of it. But I was the witness of my own actions. I knew God was changing me. I knew I was not like that. I wasn't doing any of that. But yet they kept on pressuring me, telling me that I need to live in this way. Yet the Bible doesn't say it that way. So I was praying I was praying hard and long for a long time. And one time I prayed and I just said, God, I need a miracle. I need you to show me a sign. Like you showed Gideon a sign. You showed Gideon a sign twice. Just show me one. And he did. Immediately God showed me a sign to follow him. It was hard. I was a baby having to follow God. And I did. And it was amazing. It was a memory I'll never forget. Because God brought me here right now. Because I'm now free. I'm free from spiritual slavery. Because God was sanctifying me. Because I embraced sanctification. So I encourage everyone here, embrace sanctification. It'll prevent you from being susceptible to false teachers, from false prophets. And our last point here is on knowing the scriptures, knowing the sure word. There's the story of a cult you guys will probably have heard of it, maybe just a few phrases from it. So as I tell it, you know, maybe recall it. Um, this man named Jim Jones, James Jones. He started this church called the People's Temple in the 1950s. He was a charismatic preacher who could find anyone's emotional needs and fill it. You needed a father figure in your life. He's your father. You need a friend. He's your best friend. You have a drug addiction? Hey, I have the cure for you. Hey, um, you're upset with the government? You, you need somebody to re, uh, relate with you politically? Jim's your guy. You're poor? You need help financially? Jim's your guy. He fills that emotional need so perfectly with people that he can manipulate them. His church was combined with a socialistic and communist ideals, um, and he wanted to create this utopian society. He amassed quite a large following, serving the poor, the unfortunate, the sick. He did all these things that seemed great. And they're very good things that we should strive to do. But the people of his congregation had a lot of rules on them. They had a lot of restrictions. Then, when he decided to take his church and move to a jungle in South America... He moved 1,000 of his members, 300 of them being children. Why did he, how did he get them to move? He twisted the scriptures, stating, oh, it's biblical for us to leave our families and follow Christ here. It's totally biblical for us to do that. He just twisted it in a way to get people to believe. And once they got here, they established their utopia. And it quickly got worse. It's discovered that Jim Jones was a really paranoid man. Paranoid, trying to keep control of everything, 
He had constant drug use. Goes go to figure why he had such a paranoia. He kept on telling everyone that they're being persecuted from the outside. He faked invasions into his, his little utopia that the government was coming for them. People were even publicly beaten for their crimes that they were just accused of without a trial. They basically lived in a battle of two worlds. On one hand, you have this emotional leader that fills your void, the need for emotion in your life. But on the other hand, you have this evil dictator who you're constantly living in fear. Well, one day, an American congressman named Leo Ryan, some journalists and some concerned family members of the people living down in South America came to them. And they took about 11 people out that wanted to leave. They got to the airport. And then Jim Jones's assassins drove up and opened fire on them. Killed Congressman Leo Ryan. Killed three reporters. Killed one of the defectors. And then immediately they enacted their plan of revolutionary suicide. He and his followers mixed together Kool-Aid and poison. His loyalist of followers took it first, gave it to their children, and took it. The ones that resisted, well, they were forced to do it. And if they didn't, then they were held down violently and injected with the poison. They even had stethoscopes to listen to their heartbeats to see if they were dead. It was despicable. And then Jones and another uh, killed themselves with gunshot wounds. Four people survived in that town when that happened and only a handful of others survived that were outside of the town at the time. Even people in the U.S. committed revolutionary suicide when they were phoned to do it that same day. Death toll that day, 918 people because of this cult, because of this man who twisted the scriptures. For those who survived, their lives were forever changed. To have them come back to reality is probably something that's never going to happen. And for those who spoke out, they are still dealing with it to this very day. So it's important, brothers and sisters, to maintain the sure word of God, to know it, to study it. Like the Bereans. If you remember the Bereans in Acts 17... When Paul brought the gospel to them, they searched the scriptures. They didn't believe Paul at first. They said, Paul, let us look through the Old Testament. Let us look through it so that we can know that this really is the Christ. And they did. They did diligently. And many of them believed. For me, I was a, I was a big evangelist at Sac State. I loved going and sharing the gospel with people. I loved between my classes, just meeting people and and walking up to them and just getting to know them and sharing them good news. And I, then I started studying a lot of the different cult groups because I wanted to. I wanted to go out and fight the Jehovah Witnesses on campus. I wanted, I wanted to go bring the gospel to them. There was a big old table and this old man was always there and I always saw him. And, and I'm just like, I want, to, I want to share the gospel with them. So I studied. And then I came up to him and I started asking questions, 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 because I wanted to show him that Jesus is divine. Jesus is God. And I asked so many of the right questions that he stumbled. He couldn't give an answer. He couldn't give a response because they have this like special script in their church, in their cult. And I thought, yes, victory is Lord's. This man has now heard the truth. He's going to see it. He's going to repent of his ways and he's going to follow Jesus. He's going to follow the real Jesus. This is a miracle. But then he, I let my guard down and he quickly <laughs> reverted back to his script and he planted some really bad seeds in my mind. Really, really bad seeds that I struggled with for a very long time. But I didn't want to accept those seeds. I didn't. So what did I do? I prayed hard and I studied the scriptures. I went through the Greek and understood the Greek words, understood the Hebrew words. I read through them. I went through apologetics. I connected them together for months upon months upon months on end until this seed had dried up, until God had completely healed me through his word. So I personally know 
how important it is to search the scriptures. Because if I didn't, if I didn't search the scriptures, that seed could have sprouted and grown. So, so far, next slide, we've covered an overview of truth, and we've covered the necessity of knowledge. Now we're going to be going through um, the validity of an eyewitness, Peter's eyewitness account. But I don't want to just be up here telling you about the truth, what the truth is. I want you to see it. I want you to see the truth through three eyewitnesses, first-hand accounts, who saw Jesus at the Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John. So I want us to be able to see through the lens of truth. I want us to see the truth of who Jesus is so we can be prepared for him at any moment. So back back in that time, we didn't have pictures. We didn't have DNA tests, videos, crime scene investigators, fingerprints, lie detector tests, you name it. What was our best evidence in history? Eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses that properly maintain the truth. An eyewitness is a person who actually sees some act, occurrence, or thing and can give a first-hand account of it. On the next slide, we have to trust the eyewitness, though. And there's many, many questions that we can ask an eyewitness to see if they're reliable, to see if they're trustworthy. But here's really four basic questions that are essential. Was the witness present? Has the witness been honest and accurate in the past? Can the event be verified? Does the witness have an ulterior motive? So let's put Peter on trial. Was he present? Well, we spoke earlier about the Bible being true, and it's a collection of books. It's not one entire book, but it's a collection of different authors. And Matthew, the Apostle Matthew, the tax collector, wrote his gospel And he affirms that Peter was present with Jesus, James, and John at the Transfiguration. Luke's gospel, Luke was a companion of Paul, and they definitely had time spending with the different apostles, the eyewitnesses. And he affirms in his gospel that Peter was there along with Jesus, James, and John. Mark's gospel, who was a disciple of Peter, affirms Peter was present along with Jesus, James, and John. So Matthew, the Apostle Matthew says that Peter was present. All the Apostles say that Peter was present. And Peter himself says he was present. So next question. Has he been honest and accurate? In reality, this question isn't saying, has he ever told a lie before? It's saying, is he an habitual liar? Does he constantly lie all the time? Well, the prime defense here is that the Jews wanted to be pious people that followed the law, that took the law seriously. There's countless times the Bible talks about you shall not lie to one another. Look at Leviticus 19.11 for that. And there's no evidence that Peter was a habitual liar. You could say, sure, Peter denied Jesus three times. Isn't he a liar? Well, he was fearing for his life at that time, not trying to um, give Peter credit in that time. But there's no evidence past that point that he was a, an habitual liar. So next question, can the event be verified? Can we verify that the transfigure actually, transfiguration actually happened? Well, we learned earlier that there was two other witnesses there, James and John. John, being the most detailed out of all the apostles, wrote his gospel, the gospel of John. He doesn't talk about the transfiguration. You're like, well, why doesn't John, the most detailed, talk about it? Well, he wrote his gospel later, and he saw the other circulations of the gospel and just filled in the gaps. Filled in the gaps of, oh, we need to talk about this and this and this and this. However, I'm not going to go into detail here, but it can be argued. It can be argued that John chapter 1 is John's account of who Jesus is because of the transfiguration. So, last question. Does he have an ulterior motive? He has nothing to gain. Nothing to gain by doing this. For at least by the worldly standards. It's about Christ, not about Peter. He faced physical persecution for preaching Christ. 
And Jesus even foretold of his death, that he would die to glorify God. By tradition, so not necessarily, it's not in the Bible, but by tradition, Peter didn't want to be crucified like Christ because he didn't count himself worthy to die in that way. He was crucified upside down. And lastly, at this point, he could have just went back to being a Jew. He had a good life being a Jew. Wait for the next Messiah to come. Honor God in that way if this wasn't real. And we could sit here for hours verifying who Peter is, but I really think that this evidence is valid and trusted of who Peter was as an eyewitness. On the next slide, we've covered the overview of truth, the necessity of knowledge, the validity of an eyewitness. And lastly, we're going to dive into the reality of Jesus. Let's look back at Mark 16, 28. Jesus says, and he foretells of this moment of the transfiguration, foretells of the second coming. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That doesn't make sense. That, that doesn't make sense at all when you just look at it for a first glance. You're like, how can these men see the second coming of Jesus Christ? Is it going to happen in their lifetime? Okay. But it didn't happen in their lifetime. The, the, the second coming hasn't happened yet. We're all here, right? This, this passage doesn't make sense on a first glance. But it makes sense to Peter, to James, to John, During the transfiguration, they saw the second coming. They saw the reality of the second coming during the transfiguration. It happened days later. About eight days later, it happened, the transfiguration. And that brings us to our passage in 2 Peter, verses 17 to 18. For when he received, Jesus, when Jesus received honor and glory from the God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory... This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter, on the next slide, Peter uses the word for as justification. It's a word in the Greek used to express an explanation. He was defending that he saw the second coming here. He was defending against these false teachers coming in and trying to twist the word we get a few more things out of this passage. We get, next slide, the confirmation that God spoke. Jews didn't just say the name of God. They didn't go out and say Yahweh. They said they used many substitutes. One substitute for the name of God was majestic glory. When was this affirmed? Well, it was affirmed when God spoke on the holy mountain during the transfiguration. So Peter affirms that God was speaking there. He heard the voice of God. The next point is that it's confirmation that they're not making up this second coming. Peter's like, look, we didn't make this up. In Matthew, the account of Matthew's account of the, uh, the transfiguration, he says in chapter 17, verse 2, and Jesus was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Have you guys ever looked at the sun before? How blinding that is to just stare at it? How bright it is? Do you think Peter would forget that experience? Looking at Jesus' face as bright as the sun? Or how about his clothes before LED lights were around? Radiating from the inside out. Do you think that's something he would forget? Do you think he would forget any moment of that? It's not a cleverly devised myth. On the next slide, when he said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, that is when this all made sense to Peter. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And they fell on their faces, terrified of God because he had spoken. Remember back in Exodus, the people were worshiping this golden calf while Moses is out. And then God's presence comes amongst the people and they're frightened with terror, a perpetual terror, because the presence of God is amongst them. 
That's what's going on here right now because the presence of God is amongst Peter, James, and John. And they're seeing their sin. They're seeing their uncleanliness against this holy and magnificent God. And they're on their, their faces in terror because God had spoken. They don't make this up. I'm going to tell you a story later about how that happened to me. But lastly, it's confirmation of who Jesus is. He received honor and glory from God the Father. Honor means, I'm getting this from MacArthur, he has a great description of of this passage. He says, honor means exalted status. It's Jesus exalted as a man. And glory meaning radiant splendor. Jesus' divine nature. So he's fully man and fully God, perfect in every way. And where does this come from? Where does the honor and glory come from? How did he receive it from God the Father? Well, first, it was always there. But it was affirmed. The confirmation was affirmed with the same phrase that confirms that the Father and Son are one. The phrase, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. It means just that. It means the divine essence, this is my beloved Son. The divine love, this is my beloved Son. Divine approval, this is my beloved Son, with whom I I am well pleased. In one statement, one statement, God confirmed Jesus' two natures, human and divine. He confirmed his unity with the Trinity. He confirmed his pleasure in Christ's actions and work on earth. God is so concise. So concise, they can say so much in this small amount of words. So if God appeared to you in this amazing way, such an amazing way like this. Would you forget it? After experience the presence of God, would you start making things up? Would you start lying about who God is? How perfect and holy He is? Would you lie about His presence among you, what He said, what He did? Or would you affirm the truth of who God is so people can know the truth? The band can start coming up. Um... For my life, this moment happened too. It was unforgettable, like Peter's experience. And I want to cut it down to a very very concise um, story because there's so much detail I got from it, just like Peter, James, and John got from such a small moment in time. And there's nothing I've experienced like it before. And it was a time when I was young and dumb, lost in the world, I experienced what it would be like to be away from God forever. Just a glimpse of that. A glimpse of how hopeless I was. How hopeless I was that I could do nothing to get out of that state. Then then I experienced God's presence. And it wasn't a feel-good moment. It wasn't a feel-good moment of, of awe and wonder, but a moment of perpetual fear that came upon me because God was near had that same fear that Peter, James, and John had. And then somehow I was on my knees saying the Lord's Prayer. I knew nothing except the Lord's Prayer. It's the only thing I knew. And that's all I knew how to pray. That didn't just happen once. It happened twice. But God delivered me from it. He showed me so much grace and love through that moment. He showed me, Chris, look, this is, this is where your life is headed. And then he brought me to him through repentance and belief in his son Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. And then, in that moment, and from then on, I've experienced that awe and wonder of God, that joy he brings, the thankfulness that you have because of what God has done. It was like a huge weight coming off of my shoulders. And it's something I'll never forget. I'll never forget both the fear and the love he showed me later. The reality of where we go when we die is universal. It's objective truth for everyone. It doesn't matter what culture group you're part of. It doesn't matter 
what you believe unless you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's been raised from the dead. Peter affirms this. He affirms Christ through his second coming. He affirms that Christ is coming again to bring the sword to those who don't believe. So Peter wants you to know. He wants you to know that there's a way out. He wants you to know that there's a God that loves you, that wants to have a relationship with you before it's too late. Because we don't know when the second coming is coming. It's going to be like a thief in the night when you're unprepared. So Christ is offering this free gift for you right now. Be prepared. Accept it before it's too late. So I ask, have you surrendered your life to Christ? Have you experienced the joy that comes from walking with God? I want us all to just take a minute to be able to stand and pray to ourselves, pray to God, and just reflect on this moment. Because I want today to be the day that you experience the joy of God. So let's stand and pray. Father, I thank you for this time that we can be gathered in your presence to just know who you are. God, I, I pray, I pray that you can protect us from the false teachers, the deceivers of this world. God, I pray that we can see who you are through this eyewitness account of Peter and the transfiguration of your son, Jesus. I pray that we can all be honest with you, that we can confess our sins to you and believe in your son, Jesus. God, I pray that we can trust you. I pray that we can walk with you. I pray that we can be sanctified by you for the rest of our lives, God. God, I pray for all those who are struggling right now. I pray that you soften their hearts and then you bring them peace. God, I pray for those who are thirsting after you. I pray that you, that they just continue to thirst after you and are fed by you, by your truth. God, I thank you for this family here at Bright, the family that you've given me, the family that you've given all of us. I just pray for unity amongst all of us so that we can love you together and show the love that you've shown us to the world. God, thank you. And we pray in your son's precious and holy name. Amen.